Howdy folks, this is the Comic Cowboy and I was going to do uh, this video live, but apparently to do a live stream on mobile uh, on YouTube, you have to have a thousand subscribers. Uh, but nevertheless, you know what? I don't edit my videos. I publish all the material straight from the camera, straight from the HD card into the laptop. I don't edit it. I typically use a microphone and sometimes some lighting if I need to. So right now we're just gonna go, we're gonna go live, we're gonna go raw. Uh, and today is almost like an unboxing. What I did is I just pulled out a lot of slabs in the uh, Fox Syndicate line, the Fox comic uh, line, concentrating specifically on our friend, the Blue Beetle, whether he shows up in his own line or whether he shows up in uh, Mystery Men comics. Now, Here's what I can tell you about these particular books. I started collecting them uh, in 2013. So quite a while ago, I was collecting these because I liked the Blue Beetle. I thought he was a cool superhero. And what I was looking to do was find relevant superheroes from the late 30s to early 1940s that were still relevant and existing in either the... DC Universe or Marvel. Now with Marvel, it's a little bit harder because that's a much smaller field when you're looking at Atlas, right? So DC had the whole stable of superheroes in the late 30s and for the most part early 40s, whereas uh, what we know today uh, about Marvel largely came uh, from the early 60s, you know, from Fantastic Four and that whole stable uh, onwards. Uh, that does not mean when you look at the uh, late 30s and 40s, for the most part the 40s, we're talking about right before the Second World War and through it, uh, you do have the Submariner. He, he was there. I think he's a fantastic hero uh, to collect uh, because he's one of the few that have made it over that long a period of time. He's one of the very, very few and you may know Captain America also uh, showed up at that time. And so did uh, basically an earlier version of the Human Torch that showed up in the Fantastic Four. Um, it's not the same hero. It's not the same story, origin, or composition. Uh, the Torch, as he was known uh, in the Atlas books, like uh, Marvel Mystery Comics, etc., was an android, it was a robot. It was the same depiction. I'm sure the writers, Kirby and others, relied upon that uh, when they built the character in the Fantastic Four, the character that you know today. The point being, if you can find under the radar superheroes from the Golden Age that are not Batman, Superman, Lantern, Wonder Woman, etc. There's still some guys, very few gals, but there's still some guys that have made it through the decades. Blue Beetle is one of them. You know why that pays dividends for you is because the character is still alive in current DC media. They are still writing about the Beetle in DC Comics, today is Jamie Reyes. That's the current version of the Beatle. And the Beatle originated in 39, so a year after Superman. Why that works out for you is because the writers and the property owners do not abandon heroes that are still in their active intellectual property. There will be a Blue Beetle film at some point in time, just like there was with Shazam. Blue Beetle uh, will probably be, from what I understand, maybe the Jimmy Reyes version, right? Uh, it may be paired up with Booster Gold. That's the version that uh, Ditko wrote uh, in the uh, early 60s. So we'll see. Beside me, I got stacks and stacks of these books. I'm not gonna show you all of them. I'm gonna show you a few of them. Uh, and we'll, we'll tear through pretty quickly. I think it's kind of interesting. There's not a lot of collectors um, 
that are into this niche. Now, you may think, well, that's not the case. You know, these books go for uh, a lot of money at auction. Certainly, there's a lot of collectors that are into Blue Beetle and Mystery Man comics. There are, but that number is number-wise much more niche than mainstream superheroes in the 1960s. Now, the trouble you get into, as I discovered, because I started collecting these books in 2013, you are going to run into passionate bidders uh, with deep pockets and a lot of motivation that are obsessed with Fox books. It's niche, but it's high passion, right? So that's a, that's a dangerous category, meaning if you're on a live auction, you know, the last day on Comic Connect, it keeps getting it. You, you've probably seen this on Comic Connect if you bid there. Uh, it has extended bidding. It's the only auction house that does this. If you're a consigner, it's fantastic because in theory, the auction never stops as long as bids keep coming through. They extend the timer generously. That's the difference. Uh, if you're uh, bidding on contemporary art at Sotheby's or, or Christie's, or even if you're bidding on, let's say, uh, Comic Link uh, or Heritage, they don't have this extended bidding. I actually hate it as a buyer because you can get in these very dangerous scenarios on Comic Connect, and they, and they must know this because they see the data. They see who's bidding against this, and you see a big price realized for a book. That's two guys going head to head, driving the price up maybe a third with some of these books. It's not like a large number of bidders there were to get to that point, right? But when you get in that last couple minutes and you keep seeing the extended bidding happening, watch out because you may be going up against one dude that really wants to have that book. I know for a fact uh, there are collectors that I could name uh, they're good dudes that are on the CGC boards. I know who they are, and I know they're looking for this material. I know they're bidding for it. I, I know, I literally know uh, who's on the other end in some of these auctions, and I gotta be careful uh, because I might be paying above market, right? When you're bidding against one or two people and they want the damn thing, the three of you are gonna set a price on something. You, the three of you are gonna set a record that may not reflect what the book's really worth at market if they're not around bidding for whatever reason. You may be left holding the bags. Really want the stuff. Um, I think that's the case with, with Blue Beetle. Now, the good news uh, on Beetle and uh, Fox Books is there seems to be no waning of interest uh, in, in, in these books and these titles. It, it seems to be on the, the uprise. So while I know a few prominent collectors going after this stuff, I can assure you that audience is growing. Here's the first one, 39. It's uh, restored. Uh, I bought a lot of titles uh, that uh, in this line that have defects. Uh, I try to stay away from restored books. This copy, I really liked it, uh, and the price was right, I picked it up. I usually let the restored books go. In fact, uh, just uh, yesterday uh, in Heritage's um, auction, uh, they auctioned off the Larson copy of this book, the Larson pedigree. It was conserved. It still went for $6,000 with buyer's premium. Six rands, a pr pretty nice penny uh, for that book. I think it was probably like around a 6070 copy, somewhere in that ballpark. I abstained. I did not want to spend that kind of money for um, a conserved book. Uh, but I do know who the, um, the underbidder was. Uh, and from what I understand, speaking with, with that collector, after the sale, uh, they're going heads up with, with another bidder. You, you can just tell uh, with some of the cadence and the frequency of how that um, auction lot is closing that you're going heads up, right? And if you play poker, you know when you're playing heads up, that is one of the most dangerous times 
uh, to play uh, Texas Hold'em, no limit, is when you're going heads up. Uh, because people are going to push chips in, they're going to push stacks in uh, on what traditionally might be a weak hand uh, because the odds are with them. So be careful. You got to know when to bow out of that stuff. I didn't go after the Larson book. I can tell you if I was in that auction, right, because I know another party that was the underbidder going heads up. I would have been the third party <laughs> driving up that book. And I can tell you and it's going to be reflected in GP analysis. It'll be there sold the Larson copy, $6,000. Whenever that book comes across the block again, collector's gonna, oh, what, what did this book sell for back in 2020, in July of 2020, $6,000. Uh, I, I had stain because I didn't want that copy. I would have pushed it up. Like my bids would have put that thing um, into 6,500, 7,000, because I would have entered likely more consequential bids. Whoever ended up with that book um, wanted it. So they may have had a price that they're willing to go to. Let's say they're going to $10,000 on that book in their head. I'm willing to go to 10 grand. I think that's good advice whenever you go to auction. Have the price that uh, you'd like to pay. You might get there real quick. and you, you want to be prepared to be left holding the bag. It only happened to me once. And I'll tell you, it's kind of, kind of funny story. Um, so with Comic Link, Comic Link lets you basically do tracking bids, right? Because there's no way in Comic Link, it's a really bad user experience. It's not, it's not designed very well. I love the site, I love those folks. The only way to track lots on Comic Link, this, this is ridiculous, you have to, you bid on it. <laughs> you bid on it and you look at my bids. So uh, usually when Comic Link opens their auctions up, um, that's the best time to do your tracking bids because you don't want to end up with the damn book if you don't want to buy it. So let's say you just want to know, and also Comic Link does not report their data into GP analysis, so you don't really know what those prices were. And let's say you've got a um, Hulk 181, you got a 90, and a copy is uh, being sold at Comic Link, and you don't know um, what that sale will be unless you go back to the auction and scrub for it, which you forget to do. So you put a tracking bid in there. Auction opens up on Comic Link. You wanna know what the Hulk 181.90 is gonna sell for? You put a bid in for $100. You'll be outbid right away, if not immediately. And it'll show up in your bidding activity. You've tracked it. Race. I know a lot of collectors that do this with Comic Link. It's, it's just hella, hella weird, uh, but it works. It's just, Comic Link's a small company, friends. Like. They are not Heritage. Heritage is a massive, massive operation. It's way bigger than Metropolis, Comic Connect 2, and, and Vince and those guys. It's, Heritage is selling cause collectibles. They're selling freaking minerals. Uh, they're selling movie posters. Uh, the only thing that seems like they're not selling is muscle cars from the 1960s and 70s, right? They finally said, okay, here's a category like we'll leave to Barrett Jackson and Meekum, right? But I wouldn't be surprised to get in the cars. They do everything. Much bigger operation, so I can't fault Comic Link uh, for having kind of a, um, a user interface that's not, not the best. Um, I guess it is what it is. So I put in a tracking bid on a Gym 83, a Journey into Mystery 83, first appearance, of course, of Thor in 5.5. Five. Uh, because I was interested in purchasing the book and in mid-grade and I wanted to know uh, what it would land at. I put a bid in um, kind of close to when the auction ended. This was recently of $7,200. I, I put the bid in, I'm like, oh, I was looking at GP analysis. I'm like, the book's gonna go for like $8,500, maybe up to 9,000. I won the lot. <laughs> I remember I went back uh, after that auction. I'm like, oh, you know, what? What? I'm looking at the books that I tracked. I'm like, oh, what did, what did the, um, you know, what did the Hulk one go for the, you know, Amazing Fantasy 15. And then it said, you won uh, the Gym 83, $7,200. Uh, so like whenever you've got a purchase that's unplanned for over 5,000, it's usually, it's usually a surprise. So I took it home. Um, you know, I, I told the guys at Clank, I'm like, hey, actually this was a tracking bid, um, which they may have found kind of funny. I have the book. I, I bought it like three or four months ago. Um, I think like a similar book just recently sold in that shape for around 9,500. So I know I can get my money back. 
I wouldn't do that again uh, it, it, because I might not have had the money available uh, to purchase the book and that would have sucked because I can't go back to Clank and say, hey, can you see if the underbidder um, wants the book? They might not want the book and the auction house has lost money. And it's, it's just not good business. So be careful. I have, I'm like drowning in um, Mystery Men comics and Blue Beetle here. I've got too many books to show you. Um, a lot of these are um, great presentation copies and they're in lower grade because of some of the spine, the, uh, the spine split. That is like such a tongue twister. I, I can't say it right. It's a spine split. Uh, and I, I sort of stumble on that, but uh, this is a great presentation copy of Mystery Man Comics. There's two principal lines with the Beetle with Fox Comics. There's, and it's simple, it's a uh, Blue Beetle and Mystery Man Comics. And uh, I, I took a really simple strategy with these books uh, about seven years ago. And that strategy was uh, just buy everything in sight because <laughs> that sounds kind of ridiculous, but one, there's not a lot of supply of this stuff. There are less copies in the CG census of Blue Beetle Comics number one than there are of Lantern, and then there are of Superman 1. Now, granted, I'm sure every single copy of Superman that is known to exist in a collector's hands from the early 40s has been slabbed by CGC. Not so with this book. Nevertheless, it is less plentiful. It is harder to find. I'm not sure what the exact census numbers are uh, on this bad boy here, but... There must be, I did another video. I did an earlier video on Blue Beetle and why I love them. Uh, I, I'm just doing another one because I'm actually compensating for the fact that I couldn't do this live. I just did an IG live uh, broadcast uh, to like one dude, you know, so I might as well have just given that guy a call and said, hey buddy, I know you're the only viewer. Um, you mind if we just have a phone call and I'll share information with you since I'm a, a perfect stranger. Um, these books are cool because they go through the war. Um, they go through, you know, the Second World War. Uh, so some of the cover depictions uh, canvas that material. It's, re it's really awesome. So book like this um, it is interesting to a lot of collectors. It's a, it's a bondage cover. It's a war cover. It's, uh, you know, sort of a Nazi depiction. A uh, very dramatic cover. Blue Beetle in higher grade, 7 -0. This is hard to find. I got this off Comic Link. It's a, it's a great book. Some of the early Beetles, uh, if you do collect this stuff and you want to go after it, uh, look for the covers produced by um, Charles Nicholas, uh, Lou Fine. Uh, these guys did a lot of the covers uh, in the earlier versions, and they're, they're freaking works of art. This is a beautiful rendition. And I have to tell you, uh, as the title progressed, uh, into the early 1940s, the quality of the artwork started to diminish. It's, it's sad to say, you know, I started collecting all those books, but those later books in the Fox run for Blue Beetle, the cover artwork is not as good. I'm gonna get some water here, if you don't mind. Thanks for sticking through. If you're still watching the video, I really appreciate it. I really do, thank you so much. Uh, Please do subscribe uh, to the channel. I'm trying to build the channel uh, organically uh, without a lot of fanfare uh, showing you uh, a ton of books. I mean, I'm not even a dealer. I, I, do, I do this for the joy of it, and I hope you find it um, interesting. Leave comments. Tell me about the stuff you collect. I want to know. Uh, and feel free to ask any question you may have. So most of my uh, books here are uh, CGC, uh, here's one in CBCS. I, I buy both equally without uh, favoring one or the other. It just so happens that most are uh, in CGC. I think it's just a, l a little slightly more credible, excuse me. Uh, it's true. Uh, here is Mystery Men Comics number eight. I got this off eBay for uh, 800 bucks from a dude. Terry's Comics uh, in Orange, California, down in Southern California. Good dude, solid good guy, uh, and a good uh, eBay seller. 
Um, I've got a lot of these books, Mystery Men. I got now. Um, these are mostly uh, lower grade stuff. When you get into these later Mystery Men comics books, um, this is later meaning we're still like in 19, uh, 1941. Uh, here's a 1.8 and it's because it's cover detached. Um, unfortunately, it's a, just a beautiful looking book even with the cover detached. So uh, I'm gonna wind that down. I got, I got too many books in front of me. I need to clean it up. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, over there, uh, above the couch, that is uh, Da Vinci's uh, St. John the Baptist, uh, right there. That's a great piece. It's not the original. <laughs> the original's in the loop. Uh, there's about, um, they've got about four or five pieces by Da Vinci uh, in the loop. He did not have a large body of work. He's a guy, like Michelangelo, did not have a large body of work. Uh, but both those um, artists um, covered different mediums successfully. So with Da Vinci, it was sculpture, painting, architecture uh, were the main three. Um, Michelangelo is mostly known for sculpture uh, and painting, not as much architecture, although he did dabble. And uh, that piece there uh, is in the Louvre uh, with three other works. Uh, they all go to the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa is just around the corner uh, from the main hallway. The Mona Lisa, if you've ever been to France, uh, has her own room the size of a large auditorium. And they move you through uh, a line and you only got a few seconds in front of the Mona Lisa and they usher you through uh, to let the next person go through. So people goes through, uh, they take a selfie and there's security guards there. It's in bulletproof glass. It's the most well-known work of art in the world. Uh, and they move you through so fast. Then you can go right outside and you can see this masterpiece uh, in the main hallway along with um, Madonna on the Rocks, which is a, a masterpiece by Da Vinci. Think about Da Vinci, unlike Lou Fine, <laughs> or unlike Steve Kirby, everything that Da Vinci produced and touched was a masterpiece. Every last work. He, he, he did not ever, ever produce anything less than a complete masterpiece. That work right there is um, debated about what the message and the content is. It's St. John the Baptist. That's how he titled the work. Uh, he's pointing up, which is in, indicative of a pointing to the heavens. And you can't see it uh, in my copy, but there's a cross back there. Um, many people believed that that was a, a portrait of someone that was uh, Da Vinci's um, assistant in the studio. A guy that was working for him, basically, is, is who that is. Um, and if you look very closely at the face, this work was produced before the Mona Lisa. There's a similarity between the um, face there <laughs> and the Mona Lisa. Anyway, you know what? If you like art, you like all of it, right? So like for me, comic books was just basically an extension of that. I like the artwork first. Anyway, take it easy.